You are listening to Season 2, Episode 18 of the Attempt Adventure Podcast, a podcast all about finding adventure every day and finding little ways to make your life a little more adventurous and a little more interesting. As always, I'm your host, James Barrett from Dallas, Texas, joined as always by my co-host, Michael DeRosiers in Bangkok, Thailand. All right, James, we are about to embark on an epic episode of Hiking in the Outdoors. Today, we're going to be joined by Brian Livingston, through hiker and author of The Habits of Squirrels. In this episode, we talk about hiking the Appalachian Trail. We talk about through hiking in general, practicalities, something that I've always been really interested in and really passionate about trying someday. Before we get into that, James, did you do anything new or adventurous this week? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, my wife and I have sort of gone on this journey or started this journey of kind of a competition, kind of not, mm-hmm. of basically using whatever methods you want, see how much of a different language that you can learn in a oh, year. Oh, fun. Using whatever you want. You can use whatever tools at your disposal you want, whatever language you want, anything. So what languages did you both choose? I chose Spanish. It's a language I've always been interested in. Learning should have taken it in school, didn't, no regrets, but that is the language I chose. She chose German. <laughs> it was a fun fact. I have a minor in German language. Yeah, you can kind of speak German, sort of. In the U.S. school system, language learning is not very good. So it, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You are most likely much better at reading and writing in German than speaking it. Yeah, and and as a language teacher myself, I think that's kind of common because when you're reading and writing, you can take your time. You can look at a word Mm. and think about it. But when you're listening, you need to be able to respond to it like that and code switch it like that. And I just think listening and speaking is a much harder skill because you need to be very much in the moment. You can't just pause Mm -hmm. and, you know, take your time and think about the words that you see. That's interesting because, the, you know, she's using, you know, a couple apps and some things like that. Because for her, she needs the why the language works. She needs all of that. I, you know, growing up in Texas and I did take some of a year of Spanish and, you know, just throughout life have picked up quite a bit. I'm very much still a ultra beginner in the language by all means. But if I read something that I know is in Spanish, I I don't struggle with how that word would sound in Spanish most of the time. You have enough root words as well to know these Latin roots Mm -hmm. mean these things. Yeah, and so the what I'm using is I do Duolingo, just like a one lesson a day on that, just to help keep building my vocabulary more than anything. Duolingo is both great and not great, depending on who you ask. It's it's going to be very good for learning vocabulary and things like that, and not so good if you actually want to speak the language. What I'm using is a system, I say system, it's not a system, um, it's called Dreaming Spanish. If you want to look it up, it's really interesting. Basically, it's all passive not passive, but like comprehensible, like input. So you start from the very, the the super beginner videos. It's all in Spanish entirely. There's no subtitles. They use a lot of like pictures and gestures and things. And you just watch the videos. And the goal is not to understand the words. You'll understand some, you won't understand others. But to get the context of the video, to understand the story that they're telling overall, rather than each individual word. And just put hours and hours and hours into into listening, because that, like you said, is the most difficult part. Right. There are so many different theories about language education. And for me as a teacher, the one that I subscribe to is called the communicative approach. The idea here is that communication is the method and the ultimate goal of language study, meaning you have to listen and you have to use it in order to be able to listen Mm -hmm. and to be able to use it. And it's the most effective way because it's practical. So I think you're on the right track. I think that's really good to be able to use it in a simulated communication environment. It trains your ear and you pick up vocabulary via context. Yes, yes. It's very approachable and very easy to grasp. Even someone with zero Spanish could most most of the time understand the gist of what was going on. They, They have a very good section on their website about how it works and why it works, things like that. Because... By doing that, you train your ear to hear things. You train your ear to listen to the language, which is very difficult in any language. It feels different because you don't have this active acknowledgement in your head of I'm learning, but I know I am. 
you know, and they always say, oh, it's easier for children. And it's not that their brains are different. It's just that as adults, we become very type A about learning Mm -hmm. and we want to know the structure and the rules, but that's not how our brains actually absorb a language. We still have to absorb a language naturally, you know, and it's hard. You just have to let go of that control and accept that. But that's really still how it works for us, even as adults. As adults, you have, you know, there's, there's an argument for all different types of learning language and there's a different use for all different types of study and with this one you are not going to be speaking very quickly you're not going to be reading very quickly but you will be understanding quicker and once you can understand you're going to be recognizing those words when you're reading and and able to repeat them when you're speaking and i think that's important yes and you know, that approach may not work for everyone. Some people yeah. need a very, very structured approach. For me, it's difficult to resist looking up a word that I don't know. The few times I've broken and looked up the word, I had been right about what I thought it was. Because with context, it's easy to learn. And there has been lots of studies done that show that the adult brain is still has those language learning centers. You know, it's not like they just disappear. It's not impossible to learn a language. It's hard. It is hard and it's not quick. And I think that's another thing is that you can tell someone two plus two is four and that's just what it is. But with language, you can tell them a word, but that word in different contexts means different things. And I think for me, letting go of the fact that this is not something that is going to be quick and it's not something that's going to be, you know, easy. There are certain things that come easier But it's also just a really cool thing. It's really fun. And it's practical. It's a practical skill. That's really cool, James. I'm excited to see where this journey takes you. Mm -hmm. Should be fun. So I've done um, something new recently. My mother came and visited for two weeks, and I will share all that with you guys. We'll talk about that next week. But there were two things I'd like to share today that we did. Number one, we had a meal at J5 Restaurant, the very famous Bangkok street food restaurant that won a Michelin star in 2018. Yeah, she was the first street food restaurant to win a Michelin star. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know about her. It's expensive to eat there, to be honest. You got to wait a long time, but she cooks everything herself. It's really an experience, and it's great for a special occasion. We had a crab omelet, had a yellow curry, had some grilled prawns with crispy garlic and black pepper. Everything was amazing. And then... On my mom's last day, we went to the Museum of Contemporary Arts to kill time before her flight. And they just so happened, we didn't know this was going on, they had a a Banksy exhibition. It was Hmm. Banksy's first exhibition in Asia. So we bought tickets to that, and we saw some uh, Banksy originals here on display here in Bangkok at the MoCA. I'm glad that she got to visit. Yes, it was a lot of fun. For you that that she got to visit. (laughs) It was my first visitor since pre-COVID. Yeah. Well... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, let's just get right into it. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian Livingston, author, thru-hiker, storyteller. So enjoy the interview. Brian, welcome to the show. Uh, Really glad that you're joining us today. First thing we always would like to have you do is just tell our listeners who you are, what you do, and what is your history with adventure? All right. So my name is uh, Brian Livingston. I was born and raised in Marietta, Georgia, near Atlanta, Georgia. I went to Clemson University, got my BA in history, uh, and then um, sort of took a gap year where I got most of my adventure done. Went to Nicaragua for about three months. Oh, cool. Went to Guatemala for a month, um, did, a, did a road trip, and then most notably through hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, then I started law school at Washington and Lee University in um, Lexington, Virginia. Met my wife there, got my dog, and I've since come back to South Carolina, where I've uh, I practiced law for about five and a half years. And I've uh, just in the past couple of months sort of stepped aside from that, uh, focusing on sort of publishing and promoting my debut novel, The Habits of Squirrels, which sort of ties in with my Appalachian Trail through hike. So uh, what made you want to go from from law to writing? Uh, well, I mean, writing's always been a, a dream of mine. Uh, I got into law. Um, when I went to law school, I sort of had it in my head mm-hmm. that I was going to get into environmental law and sort of, mm-hmm. you know, save the world. 
right. those jobs are few and far between. Um, and at about five and a half years into the into the career, I was not seeming to get a lot closer to those sort of jobs. Mm -hmm. So if I, uh, I wasn't really doing what I'm doing or what I was doing, to be honest. And then, um, right. you know, if you want to promote a book properly, do podcasts and stuff. Sure. Uh, it does sort of become a full time job. So, um, mm -hmm. you know. I'm doing this and then I'm, you know, applying, working, trying to get out something, you know, steady income that's more in line with, you know, what I'm about, something with yeah. the outdoors. Definitely. Well, very cool. Well, tell our readers a little bit about your book. Yeah. So it uh, it draws very heavily from my experiences through hiking the trail. Uh, it does take place on a fictional trail and it's entirely fictional. It follows sort of the, the misadventures of Gabe Jenkins. He's a recently retired mailman. And he's setting out on the hike, you know, whether he'll admit it to himself or not, to sort of figure out, you know, how he feels about his life, how his, mm. how he feels about his career, how he spent his career, and, uh, you know, his familial relationships, especially he sort of has an estranged relationship with his son. What kind of colors the book and is, uh, you know, the eccentric people that he meets, the characters that he meets that are based in some part on people I met on the trail. And then just the unique landscapes and challenges that he, he gets into um, after 50, you know, 30 years of routine, just sort of really breaking out of that and seeing some weird stuff. You know, I've never done it. It's one of my life goals to, to hike at least a segment of the Appalachian Trail. But from what I've heard from people that have done it, the people are as much a part of the experience or maybe even more of the experience than the, uh, the trail itself. Just because I heard and from what you're telling me, it sounds it's maybe true. People that go out there are definitely characters yeah it's definitely it's it's independent sort of people uh, a lot of the time and then it's a lot of people who uh sort of like gabe you know the retirees and they've just had the trail or you know this sort of thing on their wall or on their mirror mm -hmm. for a long time and they're very right. excited to be out there right. and it's a, it's an interest it's one of those rare sort of athletic accomplishments that's not like a zero sum you're not doing it against someone you're not beating mm -hmm. anybody everybody's in it together. It's, it's that. really fun. Yeah. I love that. That is cool. So, well, maybe for our listeners who don't know, let's back up a moment. What is the Appalachian Trail? The Appalachian Trail is a, um, it's a, it's a foot trail. It runs from Springer Mountain in Georgia through the Appalachian Mountains uh, up into Maine. Um, I'm not sure of the present distance or length, but the year I did it, 2013, uh, was 2,185.9 miles. Took me just under five months, you know, as a 23, 24 year old sort of sprat mm -hmm. that could move a little quicker. Um, it's been around for, uh, you know, 70 or 80 years at this point and in some iteration and um, it's managed by the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and then sort of under branches of that, there's a, a lot of local mountain clubs that actually sort of get out and do the, the maintaining. If someone wants to attempt that, what do they do? Do they just show up and start walking what do you have to do if you want to try to do it <laughs> that's more or less what i did i had a yeah. i didn't have any real backpacking experience other than um like a high school trip like via mm -hmm. my high school and then a, uh, a college trip which also had you know sort of people who knew what they were doing that sort of held your hand but um yeah i mean it doesn't it didn't take a lot of backpacking experience you just have to be willing to learn on the fly and have some right. uncomfortable nights and some uncomfortable days Right. Um, I mean, that's just outdoor stuff in general is you got to have, you got to be willing to sort of rip that bandaid and have some miserable experiences as you figure out how to do it yeah. just in general. And then how you're going to be able to do it and sort of find out your limits. But yeah, I mean, I, I had to buy everything before I went and then, you know, cobble other stuff together from the house that could be sort of repurposed for hiking. Well, what are the most important things to have with you? I would say if I was going to go back and do it again, um, and I've done this since, but go to one of those nice shoe stores where they'll, mm -hmm. they'll put you on the weird little pad that like tells oh, yeah. you everything about your feet. And then like somebody that knows what they're doing will watch you walk and learn whether you pronate and do all that. And like, you know, everybody has weird shaped feet, right. so they'll find the shoe that fits you mm -hmm. and that'll save you a lot of hassle. I didn't have shoes that worked well for me. I don't think it was a problem with the specific brand. I think it was just was a problem between me and the shoe. And um, I had a lot rougher time in terms of blisters and hot spots and sort of just general discomfort as opposed to people who had taken that hour to just go right. and learn about a good shoe and what their shoe is. 
I think that's something a lot of people overlook. And then that and uh, good socks, some good, mm. I would say, merino wool or smart wool socks. Let's back up even further. Why do people hike? For me, especially uh, when I was practicing law, it's an entirely different world. You know, you're you're out there, it's quiet, there's mountains, there's what you're doing out there. And then, you know, it's a nice retreat sort of from like being in a, you know, a four walled office where sure problems are constantly rising and they seem like they're the entire world. So it does help to sort of keep a perspective and a balance, just like the rhythm of walking can be sort of meditative. And then depending what you, you know, what you get out of nature, I like looking at all the trees and all the birds Mm -hmm. and all the animals and looking for stuff. Um, Some people, a lot of the people um, on the trail, (laughs) sort of by, especially after they've been out there for a while and seen all the animals that does nothing for them. <laughs> right. um, so it's just a different thing for everybody, depending what what you're about and what your relationship with nature is. Now I want to hear some stories. What are some of the most amazing or memorable moments you've had in the outdoors? Well, this is sort of a, a weird one because uh, it's like it started in the outdoors and it ended in New York City. But oh, um, okay. you know, along the trail there are shelters, and then some of those shelters have sort of local people like trail maintainers that'll come out and just sort of clean the shelter and just oh, look right. after particular shelter and we had stayed in one of those in new york and then we um me and the guy i was hiking with um were walking along a road and a car pulled up to us and was like hey would you like to i'm the trail maintainer or the shelter maintainer would you like to come to my house and shower and have some food and wash your clothes and you didn't turn down offers like that yeah uh, even from strangers so we, t- we took them up on it and then so like, i went and i you know was washing my clothes i got in the shower and i came out of the shower and they're like, uh, Mr. Frodo, that was my trail name. Mm. Um, do you want to go into New York City tonight? And I was like, well, yeah, that seems like an adventure. How are we doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the, the trail maintainer drove us to the train station to get the train into New York City. And then we went and did one of those lotteries before the Broadway shows. I mm. guess there's a lot. They literally like pulled names wow, out of the okay. hat. We, we won the lottery because... Um, it you know just was that kind of day yeah. and uh we were we ended up sitting front row at a at wicked uh oh, at wow. broadway show next to people in sort of like ball gowns and all dressed up and we we're sitting there wearing other people's uh cargo shorts <laughs> sure that's not how you thought that day was going to end when you woke up that morning no i thought it was gonna be on the ground again it was a fun day of just sort of uh, following the thread of uh unexpected stuff to see how big it would go and then it right. uh, got pretty big uh, i think that there's a definitely broadway a lesson show. there right just kind of embrace these improbable unlikely situations and yeah, exactly. I mean, like at any point in that chain, we could have reasonably said no right. and uh, just ended up back on the whole cold, hard ground. Yeah. OK, so you mentioned trail names. So does everyone have a trail name and how did you get yours? How did you come to be known as Mr. Frodo? Uh, the the vast majority of people have trail names. Um, some people, you know, bring sort of a nickname to the trail with them. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, that's all a trail name is. It's just a nickname. Yeah, um, I got named on the trail uh, more or less. But uh, you know, I am short, I'm hairy, I have really big feet. So ever <laughs> since Lord of the Rings movies came out, my sisters have called me a hobbit <laughs> and uh, made it kind of fit. And then so when I decided to do a long hike, you know, which resembled what Frodo does in the movies, sure. I uh, went on Amazon and got like one of those little sort of cheapo $4 knockoff rings and oh. wore it in a necklace like he did. Oh, cool. And um, I had another nickname for a little while. It was Nika, it was short for Nicaragua because I'd been to mm. Nicaragua. Then I started hiking with new people and they saw the ring. We're not calling you anything other than Mr. Frodo. (laughs) Right. What about safety? What about safety? Did you find yourself in any kind of dangerous situations? Yeah. I mean, you know, sort of more weather stuff. Never, Mm. I never felt unsafe around people. Usually if you sort of feel unsafe around people, it means you don't anyway. So you're not going to pitch your tent next to them. Yeah. Uh, I had a couple days. I got, sick in north carolina when it was still snowing and we were you know, like just over a day's hike out of town mm. and so you're just being sick i had to sort of press and get into town mm. and uh yeah luckily i was hiking with my brother-in-law at that point he had come and stop with me but that was the only time where i was thinking like if i don't stop then this turns into or if i do stop if i don't make it to town then mm-hmm. this turns into sort of a life or death. Does Brian wow. or Mr. Frodo return from this journey situation? Wow. Yeah, you know, just watching watching the weather is a big part of it. Um, you know, trying not to camp if you're you know if you're caught out in it. Try not to camp at the higher points. 
mm. trying not to camp under dead limbs. Um, I think more hikers are killed than you would think just by fallen branches and stuff because they oh, right. pitched under a dead tree or a tree of dead limbs. Mm. And then, you know, the, the logical stuff mm. of um, don't sleep with your food. Don't sleep with right. sense. And, right. You know, don't sleep with people that make you uncomfortable. But I mean, by and large, everybody like in terms of people everybody was very very nice Uh, i didn't go around antagonizing people or animals Um, on that front safety just kind of came natural right well let's talk about the animals because you know i grew up in texas and i'm kind of familiar with that area and and more of the west what kind of animals do you encounter out east there are there are a lot of bears all throughout the trail um i think Mm, i saw six (laughs) on my hike never a, a bad encounter usually running from me by the time i saw them um, up north, you get the moose, which can be kind of, they can get agitated. Right. You know, people and, think, oh, they, they don't eat meat. They're not dangerous, but they're big. <laughs> they're just really. Yeah, they're, they're big and dumb and easily agitated. Um, <sighs> yeah. I, I only saw one. Uh, it sort of hissed at me because I tried to take a picture of it, but, you know, we, I wasn't right up on it. The ticks and the bugs are the things you really got to watch out mm. for, I'd say, on a day-to-day basis. Just keeping the bug spray on, have the permethrin, which is like the super tick repellent killer. Yeah. And then a lot of people got Lyme disease from ticks. I think that's mm. just a, a part of it. <laughs> right. Is there a season that you would recommend? I mean, do you recommend even just doing it all in one one go? Would you recommend breaking it into smaller legs? And if so, like what time of year would someone or should somebody consider going? It's hard. The, that is the major, I would say, pitfall of the through hike is you don't really catch any part of the trail uh-huh. at its natural splendor. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I guess depending when you hike. Uh, I started March 12th and ended August 3rd. I uh, started south and then ended in Maine. The people who people do like sort of chunk it up and they'll do like they won't do it all and just one south mm-hmm. to north go. They'll just sort of take different chunks and hit places at different at better seasons. You know, it's a, sort of a different experience. But if you're looking for good weather and the best views and, you know, when all the flowers and uh, blueberries or whatever are blooming in different spots, that's a much smarter way to do it. And you get the best experience Mm. in each spot. Uh, It's hard to say when, uh, you know, when each spot has its own season. What about the people? What are some of the uh, most interesting people that you met? You know, when I I started hiking, I started alone and then I met a friend in, um, in, Pennsylvania that I ended up hiking the rest of the trail with like just under a thousand miles um you know he's he's sort of a character he uh he I'm not sure if he still does this but he would go and fish in the summers in Alaska Mm -hmm. and make you know money for the year and then he would go and sort of travel the world for the rest of the year a thing that he and I had happened to us in uh southern New Hampshire um near Smarts Mountain which are like south of the White Mountains in New Hampshire um I forget maybe someone had given us a ride into town and offered to let us stay at their house and it was an older lady and she said you know I'll let y'all stay at my house but you have to agree to do something for me and uh, you have to say yes before I tell you what it is and because hmm. we we're both in our early 20s and the world was different back then it was like yeah, yeah sure <laughs> well, what do you got and she pulled out this little uh like a uh, ziploc baggie of gray powder and she's like these are the ashes of my dog quester quester was born or was found on smarts mountain which was i guess like two days up from uh, where we were um would you please hike his ashes up to smarts mountain and sort of give him a funeral and so uh, you know, we did we we hiked with this dead dog's ashes in our um in beacon's back that was my buddy uh for two days and then we uh, the mountain just happened to have like a fire tower on it and we got there around sunset and had a, a pretty nice memorial for this woman's wow. dog it seems like people are just really kind out there you know and willing to help each other yeah it's it's hard to think of uh anywhere else in the you know in like the, i guess american culture where you, you yeah. find that and there's the whole trail magic culture sometimes you'd come into gap the road crossings and there'd just be people you know sitting there cooking up a pot of chili or grilling stuff for the hikers as they pass by especially early on when it was really cold and i was really fighting my shoes and fighting just all the you know going through my learning pains just getting that surprise hot meal and a friendly face was really it really yeah. did a lot and it may yeah. change the outcome of the hike because otherwise, what are you eating? If I was going to do it now, it'd be freeze-dried food. Since I was younger at the time, there was a lot of ramen and a lot mm. of instant mashed potatoes for dinner, mm. uh, usually with either like summer sausage or like canned tuna as the I protein. Know. 
like tortillas with peanut butter and dried fruit for lunch, off-brand Pop-Tarts for breakfast. Right. But I would, I would have to clean that up considerably now. So like how many days at a time are you usually in the in the wilderness before you can like go back to a town and, and restock? Like how many days worth of food typically do you try to carry with you? I, th- I think four is the average, like four nights. And okay. then usually you're back into a town to resupply, shower, spend a night in a bed, you know, that kind of stuff. That must feel um, so good. <laughs> yeah, that, that can vary a little bit depending on speed and where you are and just the different towns. But sure. that's usually what I aim for. Because over four days of food is a lot of food and it's it's just a lot to carry. Yeah. And I'm sure it's just like a neurotic twitch, Uh, but just uh, when like when something's in your pack that you didn't want it to be in that pack, you really feel that extra weight. Got to carry that that fifth pack of ramen, which weighs two ounces. On that note, were there any items that you did bring with you that you realized were just useless and that you regret having carried? The stuff I, I started off with a snake bite kit it had mm. a little uh suction plunger that you could put on a snake oh, bite yeah, I've seen those, yeah. i don't know about the science behind those but <laughs> um it wasn't what i wanted to be relying on and then just like all a lot of the i think i had like an extra flashlight and that you really don't need one flashlight you should have mm. a headlamp i would carry a lot of water towards the end instead of going out and buying a proper camping sleeping bag I just used my older sister's slumber jack from her old mm. like sleepovers from the basement. That was heavy and useless. All right. um, that'd be another thing where it'd be worthwhile to, to maybe hit that $150, $200 mark on your sleeping bag mm. that make it, make it a good one or a decent one. What about injuries? I know you mentioned things like blisters and things like that. Did you ever have any kind of uh, injuries? And, and what do you do if that does happen? Because you're presumably pretty isolated at a lot of points. Yeah. Um, I got pretty lucky on that front. Um, you know, I probably had like stress fractures in my feet and stuff, but nothing that mm. kept me from hiking. I think that was just a result of hiking a lot. Yeah. Um, I had to, I took a day off in Marion, Virginia, cause I got two blisters that got infected and I had to mm. sort of work my way into the free clinic there. And they were, they're really nice to me now that I think about it. They, they popped them and cleaned them antiseptic did them and, uh, got me sort of back on my feet. Um, the injury, the injury t- situation is tough. I, I had a couple of falls that I sort of, you know, was maybe two days out of town and you, mm. you land and you get back up and well, really glad that worked out. <laughs> right. I could walk that my could way have been out a lot it. worse. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, mean, I think uh, if you get, you get injured out there, it's just a matter of, you know, if you have your phone and you have service, if you can't yeah. get out of there, just making that call and trying to, trying to get out or waiting for someone to, to come by that can help you. How easy is it to actually get a cell connection out there? So even back in 2013, I think Verizon more or less covered Mm. the, maybe not the entire trail, but pretty reliably at some point in the day, (laughs) you could get a message. Uh, I had AT&T and I did not have that luxury. Ah, Um, okay. Yeah, nine years out of date. Maybe they've revamped their system, but uh, it's better than you would think. It's a nice uh, modern safety net. How often do you actually encounter other people? Uh, pretty much pretty much every day. Uh, mm. I think I was on the trail 144 nights, and I think I spent six alone. And those ah. are more or less because I had sort of chosen to spend those nights alone. If you want to spend the night with people every night, you can. And then if you, like, if you want to sort of stagger it a little bit, you can you know, find a way to spend more nights alone. Uh, particularly towards the beginning, and I think this mm. has only grown, um, I think my first night on trail, I counted like 60 tents where oh, I wow. started. I, <laughs> I started sort of in the meat of when people were starting. Right. And so there's a lot of people at that shelter that was only like right. eight miles from uh, Springer Mountain. Oh, okay. We've been talking a lot about the AT. What are some of your other favorite outdoor places, either in the U.S. or in your travels around the world? Uh, so you know, now I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, and um, I'm looking to explore. There's a lot of right old rice paddies here that they've sort of, I guess they have dikes really? around. You go and walk around the dikes. And they're, I mean, I love alligators. So that's my main draw. But I mean, they're loaded with like really cool birds. A lot of birders come down to this area for that reason. Cool. Uh, and then, um, you know, cool, cool fish, cool turtles, um, you know, I guess the occasional deer or bear. But uh, yeah, that's um, what I've been doing. Uh, I don't know if I would kayak in there because there were a lot of alligators. That's sort of my uh, my current kick. What about your uh, dream destinations? 
what are some of the big hikes or places you'd like to go? Uh, yeah, being Mr. Frodo and being a nerd and very into those Lord of the Rings movies, I do want to go to New Zealand and um, right. I can't say the name of the trails like Te Aurora, but there's a yeah. there's a better yeah. way to say it. But it takes you over you know the mountain that served as um, Mount Doom, oh. and then I think it also will take you through like the little uh, sort of Shire, fake Shire oh, that cool. they built. That's that's my dream. Um, you know, my wife and I we do a lot of the or we're working on doing the uh, the national parks through mm. the United States. We did Yellowstone a couple of years ago, Congaree here in South Carolina that we've been to a couple of times. Um, we're going up to Pictured Rock National Lakeshore uh, on the Michigan Upper Peninsula next month, and then I guess our our big thing is um, Glacier. We're working on that oh, wow. for 2023, that's- I believe. What are your favorite national parks that you've been to? Yellowstone blew my mind. A yeah. lot of a lot of really big creatures uh, that you wouldn't think were domestic to the, the U.S. And then it's like you know five different national parks in in one. It has its own giant waterfalls, its own you know Grand Canyon, its own big valleys with cool um, you know wolves and uh, mountain goats and everything. And then you know, obviously the Old Faithful and those everything. Um, we also, for our honeymoon, we went on a safari in Zimbabwe and Botswana. That was a another thing that sort of just sort of never, all these animals I never thought I would see. What kind of things did you encounter there? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, elephants were sort of like deer over there, just, you know, all <laughs> wow. over the place. Um, you know, hippos, uh, I think we counted like 40 lions. My wife saw a leopard. I didn't see a leopard. I'm kind of salty about it. Uh, wildebeest, all the, the, you know, the big antelope and all that. So whether it's uh, halfway around the world or close to home, right, there's adventure to be found, like wherever you look. You know, there's easy adventures off to the, the right side of 45 minutes away, or there's the 20 hour plane ride. What advice would you give to someone that maybe doesn't adventure, but kind of wants to? I mean, I think I've heard y'all talk about it on prior episodes. So it's sort of a cop out, but just, you know, those easy nearby parks that you haven't sure. been to yeah. in uh, the part of the world you know start going there and just sort of walking around and seeing all the little side trails that these places usually have because most of them you know have some sort of park superintendent who loves them and has added the like the features um and then you know just working branching out from that and then mm-hmm. you know maybe you know you hear a lot of people who sort of their interest gets piqued by a documentary or just like a blog that they read about a different spot Right. So you check those out and see if you can put something sort of big yeah. on your uh, on your horizon and you know, work up towards it. My yeah. wife and I did get stalked by a lion on foot, oh. which um, oh with a, a different <laughs> sensation. Um, I, I guess depending on where you uh, safari, you can do a walking safari. Mm. And since I consider myself a hiker, I was like, well, yeah, we should do the walking safari. You're with a guide. The guide has a rifle. So we were driving out to do our walking safari and we saw a pride of nine like laughably full lions, you know, like mm. the big distended bellies yeah, sort yeah. of waddling around. And we stopped and looked at them for a while and our guide was telling us about it. It's like, oh, they must have just had a kill last night. You know, I wonder what drove them off the kill. It'll be interesting. You can see where they're coming from. We can track back and see what the kill was. And, um, you know, in hindsight, all this seems very foreseeable. So we watch them and then we drive on to, you know, do our walking safari and we park and we start sort of walking the direction where he thinks the kill is. And man, we don't make it like maybe like a hundred yards and we're there and it's just me and the guide and my wife and um, uh, just a lion head pops up from above the grass, like, you know, 20 meters away from us. And you know, like a couple of days before us, they told us that, um, a lion can move like 22 meters in a second or something ridiculous. And the guide's cool at this point. And he's like, oh, like, look at you guys. Like me and my wife are sort of shaking and looking at it. He's like, aren't you guys going to take a picture? I mean, (laughs) I'll try. And uh, it like took a very blurry picture of this sort of orange block. I bet. Yeah, we we stood there for a second. And um, the guy was like, all right, well, obviously we can't go this way anymore. There's lions in the area. We should go back to the the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems smart. And we start to walk and the lion starts walking with us. That's a, it's an image. Like I'll never forget. Like the eye, the lion going from sitting to just taking that first step. And like, uh-huh. No, no, no. Where are you guys going? So we like the guide stops us, you know, like shakes his like rattles his um, rifle at him, like shouts for a little bit. And we start walking again. 
the lion starts walking again. Mm -hmm. And so the guide stops us again and puts on a much more vigorous display. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, well, hopefully this took care of it. We start walking again. The lion starts walking again. And the guide stops and uh, like really rattles. He picks up um, like some elephant dung, like a weird ball, which I never Uh would have guessed, like a big ball. And he like starts sort of throwing that and some, uh, some nearby like driftwood at the lion sort of in its direction, but not directly at it. And like puts on a display for like 90 seconds. And then we start walking and the lion doesn't walk. And so you okay. sort of, you don't want to show it your back. So you sort That's of what I was thinking. Cause the... like, I don't know about yeah. lions, but I know that like in the U S like mountain lions, you do not ever want to turn away from them. I guess that triggers a big uh, predatory instinct in them. Yeah. And I guess understandably so. So yeah, we, we took a, a very, you know, like it's only 75 yards at this point, but it, it felt like forever just to yeah. sort of pacing and creeping back, making sure that the lion was, and then uh, I'm glad he didn't tell us this until then, but like, we got back to the car and the guy looked at me and my wife was like, thank y'all for not panicking. That's never happened to me before. Oh, gosh. <laughs> like, I want to go back to the hotel now, please. <laughs> yeah, let's go back inside. And then we got back in the car and he like he wanted to see, um, you know, the rest of, like, he still wanted to see the kill. Yeah. And we drive up to where that lion was and it was like one of nine lions. Oh, they're no. sitting there around like a dead wildebeest that's terrifying i mean my cat likes to stalk me for fun and that's scary enough and he's blind i can't imagine like having a like an actual like large cat of any kind like sizing you uh, it, you're like, i grew up with cats it was wild how similar the movements were like really you know, like the lion watching us like sort of amused like a cat will watch like a cockroach or a bug uh-huh. but it knows it's eventually going to kill yeah, yeah. the bug starts like scattering away like, no 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 you come back here like i'm not right, kind of playing with it right exactly yeah like the, movement the lion made god wow wow <sighs> unforgettable though that's those are the things you know the, like again another theme is like the adventures begin when things go wrong that's where you get these stories to tell right yeah if you hadn't seen anything if you hadn't been stalked you know, you have a good time, but this is a good story that you're always going to be able to tell people over over a beer at the bar or whatever. Like my wife and I were both there. We'll sit just and tell that story to each other. Yeah, so we'll, we'll bring it up. You know, pro pro of nothing. And just like, yeah, oh. remember the time we got stuck by a lion? We're we're glad it happened, and we're also glad it's over. Yes, definitely. Well, Brian, where can people find you online, and and where can they get your book? Yeah, uh, I'm all over the place. I'm uh, Instagram is probably where I'm most active uh, at Brian Livingston Books, uh, Twitter at Livingston Books, and then Facebook author Brian Livingston. Uh, you can find my book uh, on my website, brianlivingstonbooks.com, and you can find it on uh, indiebound.org um, if you don't like Amazon, um, which you know a lot of people don't, and then and you can also find it on Amazon because uh that's just the the realities of being <laughs> right. an independent book uh, yeah. author in the safe day and age well we will definitely put links to all of that in the show notes and uh people can i appreciate it click right through and, and they can go to our website attemptadventure.com and we'll have all of that right there so it'll be all all in one place very cool well what are your plans next so i know that this book is is really new but are you working on any others do you have a second book in the works at the moment i'm poking around on a, a second book um mm-hmm. you know this book Took, the Habits of Squirrels took me about four years, so it's yeah. sort of intimidating to, to start on a, a second one, but I'm poking around with it sort of in the early chapter, seeing where it's going. Uh, I've written a couple of short stories um, you, know, you can check out. I have a newsletter that you can sign up for on my uh, Instagram, Okay. Um, and you know, just sort of seeing if any of these embers really take off and turn into awesome. something that I, you know, I want to spend a lot of time with. And uh, we'll be really excited to see where your adventures take you next. I'm excited as well. I really appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton for coming on. I had a great time. Appreciate y'all having me. This is something I've always wanted to do through hike through the U.S. I think the, the Pacific Crest Trail is the one I'm most, I would want to do. It's pretty intense, I hear. It is, because you start in Mexico and end in Canada, at the border of Mexico and the border of Canada. But you go through mountain, like pretty heavily mountain areas. I don't know, you go through some pretty heavily mountained areas on the Appalachian Trail as well. What are some other trails? Here's an article I found from Adventure, with, without an E, Adventure.com, uh, America's Best Through Hike, Six Backpacking Adventures Across the States. 
Pacific Crest Trail, yeah, 2,667 miles, average time five months. Uh, the Continental Divide from New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, 3,100 miles, six months. Appalachian Trail, 14 states, 2,185 miles, five to seven months. The Long Trail in Vermont, well, now this isn't so bad, 19 days, 273 miles. That could be fun. It's the oldest long-distance trail in the United States, which follows the spine of the Green Mountains from Massachusetts to Canada. Hmm. The Arizona Trail, 800 miles. The Florida Trail, 1,300 miles. So, James, I'll share this link to you. You can have a look at this, and we can maybe um, well, maybe definitely put it on our uh, website as well in our show notes. So the high point on the Pacific Crest Trail is 13,000 feet. The high point on the Continental Divide Trail is 14,000 feet. Um, Appalachian Trail, 6,000 feet. Long Trail, 4,000 feet. Arizona Trail, 9,600 feet. And then the Florida Trail, 102 feet. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do the Florida Trail. I bet we can manage you just that. Walk. Yeah. If you can cope with the humidity. Yeah, go in the wintertime. Yeah. But anyway, that's cool. So, anyway, yeah, it'd be something to undertake sometime. I think it'd be a fascinating adventure. Um, I loved hearing Brian's stories, that was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Guys, check out his book, The Habits of Squirrels. I will put links to all of this in the website show notes as well, attemptadventure.com. James, it is time for our favorite segment, Adventures in the News, and this week it is your turn. So, this is called A Thanksgiving Miracle. A man went missing from a Carnival cruise ship in the Gulf of Mexico and was rescued. Oh, all right. Well, that's good news. Usually, that is not what happens. I thought this was going to be like a, an Agatha Christie thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, the, he just disappeared one day. Wow. Um, it was about 11 p.m. when he walked off. And then around noon the next day, on Thanksgiving Day, he was reported missing. So he just treaded water for like 12 hours? You know, James, when I was in the Boy Scouts, I got my life-saving merit badge. We had to tread water for mm -hmm. like 15 minutes, and it nearly killed me. Yeah, we had to in do a, 30. In a swimming pool. Maybe it was 30 minutes. Maybe it was 30 minutes. But that was just in a, in a still pool. I can't imagine doing it for 12 hours in the ocean with waves and stuff. I hope they gave him like a drink voucher when he got back on board. <laughs> He was rescued by a Coast Guard Jayhawk helicopter, and he was still responsive. He was showing signs of hypothermia, shock, and dehydration, but, was, but could walk and could communicate. He gave no clear indication on why he fell overboard. <laughs> it's estimated that he was in the water for more than 15 hours. I bet he doesn't get back on a cruise ship. Unless they give him, like, a lifetime pass. It's like, you know, if, like, you, if you, like, give birth on the airline... Like they give your baby like, mm. free, like free tickets. <laughs> but like, think about it. This guy just walked off and at some point fell off a cruise ship. And those things aren't, those things are tall. Oh, they're like 10 stories tall sometimes. That's scary. Yeah, he, depending on where he fell from, he not only spent some time falling and then he had to watch the cruise ship disappear. That would be so terrifying. My gosh. Can you imagine? And then it was noon the next day. Mm. <laughs> when they were like, oh, he's gone. <laughs> I Actually, the search didn't start until like 3 p.m. the next day. Because... It's, like, it's such a big place. I mean, cruise ships are so big. Yeah, How do you, you even... They have tell... to search the entire thing first. Yeah, maybe you just got lost. Or maybe you're in the casino or, you know, you whatever. You found your way you below do. deck. I don't know. Yeah, exa yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I can't but believe like, they rescued him. I mean, yeah, I don't like... Treading water's hard. I don't it want to is. do that for 15 hours. I know. I, I can't... I do not understand how he did it. That's <laughs> incredible. I do know how to turn my pants into a life preserver, so maybe he mm, did that. Me there. too. Yeah. Also, life-saving merit badge. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of have to be wearing jeans for that to work, though. Yeah, if you're not wearing jeans, and you still have to reinflate, like, every five minutes. Because it turns out jeans, not watertight. Who would have thought... <laughs> no, and if you're wearing shorts, you're just out of luck. Although maybe you're not wearing shorts at 11 p.m. on a cruise ship. It's probably in like a tuxedo or something. <laughs> or sweatpants. Sweatpants. Ugh. <laughs> Wet sweatpants. Gross. Mm. That was the least of his worries, I'm sure. 
but <laughs> yeah, I don't think he was probably worried about what pants he was wearing at the time. I don't think I'd get back on the ocean. I think I'd be done with the sea. You would think after an hour, you would think that you were dead. You would think there's no oh, chance, yeah. you know? And the fact that he spent, he fell at 11 p.m. He spent that first night in just pitch blackness in the ocean. Like, nah, well, good for him. Good for his family. One, finding him is crazy. Because that is one person. In the deep blue sea. In, <laughs> in the ocean. The big blue wet thing. Yeah. Love that movie. <laughs> Too. It's an under. It's, an, it's such an underrated. It is the best retelling of Treasure Island. It is so good. That's one of my favorite films. Oh man. Well, anyway, so that's my news. Well, that's good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to our episode today. Don't forget to check us out on social media where we are Attempt Adventure on everything. You can also find us at attemptadventure.com. You can get in touch with us by clicking on the contact us button or via email. Hello at attemptedventure.com. All right, guys, James, thanks for talking to me today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to us today. And until next time, keep adventuring. Keep adventuring.